Welcome to this virtual panel discussion regarding prime London property. My name is Jonathan Champong and I'm a partner in the residential property team at Wedlake Bell. And I'm delighted to be joined by our guests today, Jeremy McGiven of Mercury Home Search and Camilla Wallace, also of Wedlake Bell. Now, by way of background and introduction, Jeremy is a leading expert on acquiring property in London. He's inspected over 23,000 properties and acquired hundreds of millions of pounds worth of property for the clients of Mercury Home Search. He's an internationally recognized speaker and the author of the only book on buying property in prime central London entitled The Insider's Guide to Acquiring Luxury Property in London. Camilla, or Millie as we like to call her, heads up the private client group at Wedlake Bell. Now, she specializes in assisting clients with their personal tax and estate planning affairs, and in particular, how they structure the ownership of assets, uh, succession to those assets, and enjoyment of those assets. Millie's clients are largely individuals and trustees based here in the UK or overseas. Now, there's so much to talk about when it comes to prime London property, but I thought we'd focus on things like the market, tax considerations, and what might be on the horizon. But seeing as we've got Jeremy, an expert on acquiring property in London, I think I have to ask Jeremy, in your view, why is London such an attractive location for high net worth individuals and families? Well, if you're a high net worth individual, uh, you have the luxury of being able to afford whatever you want. And so London is attractive because it is one of the only two cities that offers the entire package to ultra high net worth individuals and high net worth individuals. Uh, the other city being New York, because London is a financial centre. So if you want to do business, uh, it is one of the best places in the world, not just from the financial perspective, but you have all the other ancillary services. So you know, solicitors, tax advisors, um, advertising, PR, you know, amazing tech scene and so on and so on. Uh, in addition to that, obviously, it's a wonderful city to live in. You have the theatres, restaurants, shops, culture. Uh, and combined with that, which is where London and New York, or I should say the US and the UK, differ from every other country. Is on. In addition to that, we have world-class education systems, um, which are particularly attractive to Asian, Middle Eastern uh, buyers. So... There's that, and also, in addition to that, the rule of law, relatively stable political uh, environment, mean that London and New York are both incredibly attractive to high net worth individuals. I mean, speaking about what, what's going on, uh, 2020 has been a very interesting year for all sorts of reasons, and not least in the uh, field of residential property. How has the current situation affected your clients' interest in acquiring property in prime central London? Uh, it's a very good question. And it, it very much depends on where you're based. I mean, ultimately, as I'm sure you and Millie have both seen, is there is a vast amount of money out there that has been sitting on the sidelines for several years due to uh, all the political uncertainty we've seen with uh, not only Brexit, but also uh, the potential for Corbyn to become prime, prime minister, which I have said always thought was overestimated. But um, we are where we are today. The we took on a lot of new new clients during lockdown uh, because a lot of people are concerned about their wealth being eroded by quantitative easing and uh, inflationary policies. I mean, the Fed came out yesterday, basically saying that you know we're going to keep supporting the system, and we think government should pump more money more money in, and we're going to keep interest rates low for at least three years which shows you ultimately what they, they're doing. Um, so people are, are worried about their cash being devalued. The problem for some of our clients is that they, they simply, well, it's not that they can't get into the country, but they don't fancy uh, you know, quarantining for two weeks and then potentially quarantining, uh, being in quarantine for two weeks when they go home. So some people simply haven't been able to get into the country. We've got um, uh, clients in Dubai, for example, uh, Hong Kong, they can get into the country, but when they go back, they have to quarantine for two weeks. So that has been an issue, and that is reflected in the market. So if you look at areas like uh, Marlebone, Mayfair, Knightsbridge, Belgravia, 
they have been relatively quiet in comparison to more domestic markets like Notting Hill, Kensington, Chiswick, Fulham, and so on. Sure. Uh, one thing I've noticed in speaking to um, estate agents, so you know, in recent months, is that they've talked about um, an increase in activity generally and in London, but they've, they've also talked about um, in, a significant increase in activity uh, in relation to people moving outside of London. What are your thoughts on that? And do you think that's something that's you know set to continue? Yeah, there's definitely been more people moving to the countryside and I think the numbers are definitely higher than they would normally be although I would also say that there's a significant amount of pent-up demand where people are delayed purchasing the country again because of all the political uncertainty not so much Brexit but I think more um, to do with Corbyn and whether he was going to come in with various wealth taxes and goodness know what it knows what else he had planned uh, which is why he failed so miserably so um there has been a move to the countryside and again you know move from people in smallish flats in in london to slightly further out in london so fulham chiswick etc so there's a move for more space and outside space because obviously you know people have been cooped up in their homes for several months during one of the most glorious early summers we've ever witnessed um so there is definite move for outside space however i'm very cautious. I'm advising our clients, look, stick to the basics. Um, you know, people are saying they won't need to be near uh, transport to get into the city and so on. So why would you pay a premium to be near an underground station and so on? Well, I think it's very dangerous to think that people will never return to the offices. Um, Steve Pinker, who is the head of psychology at Harvard, was on Bloomberg um, and he was being asked about this. And he said, you know, in the, in the depths of a crisis, pundits go into overdrive and they come up with all sorts of scare, door, scare stories and theories about how things will change. And he used 9-11 uh, as an example when we were told that no company would ever have its headquarters in one building again. Um, we would never go to sporty events or music events in stadium. And obviously it's complete nonsense. You know, we just revert to normal because human nature does not change overnight. Um, and so I expect, you know, people to be back in offices, maybe working in a slightly different way, but still needing to get into the office and having good uh, transport nearby. So I I think there, there will be an initial increase in people moving to the countryside, but there's not going to be a mass exodus from London or indeed any other major city. Sure, sure. Millie, if I could just bring you in here. Um, uh, Jeremy mentioned tax briefly there. How do you think the uh, SDLT holiday has impacted residential property transactions generally and in London? Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, with COVID uh, and pent up demand, I think that SDLT holiday has helped to see an increase uh, at the lower end uh, and sort of mid value levels of the market. Um, a saving of up to £15,000 does make a noticeable, noticeable difference for, for that that level of buyer but for the ultra high net worth buyer it's a nice to have but but not a deal breaker and um there are other reliefs available which could help the sdlt holiday like multiple dwellings relief but um it, for the ultra high net worth it's it's not really uh, having that much of it, an impact where where it does help though i think is with estate planning uh and that's uh, because usually uh, gifts are outside the scope of uh, stamp duty land tax. It, it only bites when consideration takes place. And usually that would be where money changes hands. Um, but with some depressed values and possible tax hikes, we are seeing families look at handing down property to the next generation. And uh, where there is a mortgage on a property, ordinarily that would attract stamp duty land tax. So we are seeing families take advantage of the holiday and carrying out some estate planning, intergenerational estate planning. Sure. OK. Um, and I know you deal, um, as I do also, with a lot of um, overseas um, clients or clients that are based overseas. Um, have your clients that are based overseas expressed any concerns about 
the uh, rates of SDLT for non-UK residents, uh, which are set to increase and take effect next April. Yeah, I mean, any any tax hike is not going to be well received uh, by an individual. And I think ultra high, high net worth clients are no different. Um, but they tend to add such extra cost onto the overall cost of making the purchase. And that purchase may be driven by non-tax objectives. Uh, this is something that uh, I think Jeremy sort of touched on. People come to London and invest in property here for lifestyle, uh, safe harbouring capital, business relocation or expansion, family education, political stability, um, rule of law, you know, all of the above. And so that extra 1% charge, I don't think it's going to be a deal breaker. Um, where it might affect people is the smaller overseas investor who was clubbing together with family members to invest in UK residential property. And in that situation, they might be dissuaded uh, if they don't foresee a, a sufficient return on their capital generally. I see. OK. Um, and what about the autumn budget? Because there are there are fears that we're going to see significant tax rises in the autumn budget. I've read about um, changes to the inheritance tax regime and increases in capital gains tax. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, sure. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I, I think the Office for Tax Simplification is pretty busy at the moment. Um, they've got various consultations out on the simplification of capital gains tax and inheritance tax. And as you say, various commentators have suggested the possibility of an increase in CGT. Um, quite worryingly, the suggestion is that it would be at parity with income tax. Um, which is where it was when I first started practicing. So I would say that a top rate of 20% for non-residential and 28% for residential property is fairly benign and generous. Um, other reliefs that might be on the hit list are the un unlimited use of capital losses, uh, rebasing on death and principal private residence relief. Um, some people are calling changes to CGT like this a form of stealth wealth tax. Um, it, it's difficult to say whether it's realistic, uh, particularly, you know, far reaching reforms, for example, uh, changes in tax rates. Ordinarily, this doesn't happen halfway through the tax year. So is the autumn budget really going to do that? But that said, I think there is precedent for as of midnight tonight. And, and we've mm -hmm. seen that your team, Jonathan, have been extremely busy with <laughs> Absolutely. changes, trying to get in there before they come in. So, so uh, I mean, there might well be, uh, you know, change ahead. It's worth noting that, that with PPR, so Principal Private Residence Relief, um, changes to that would really penalise those who've been in properties for a long time uh, and impact downsizers who want to release equity, lease capital cash for their retirement. And it also um, can hamper uh, people who want to move up the housing ladder, because how can they move up the housing ladder if there's a sizable tax bill when they sell their home? And so um, you might argue that changes of that nature, so getting rid of principal private residence relief, would in fact go against the stamp duty land tax holiday in that it would slow down transaction levels. So. Um, Possibly, um, we would hope, and we've said this in our formal response to the government, um, that they would uh, take time to consider the changes and possibly put, put the taxpayers on notice. Um, now, that is CGT. Um, you've asked about IHT, inheritance tax. Mm. What is at threat there? What would be an easy one for the government to go for and, and change? And possibly the seven-year rule uh, around gifts of capital. Uh, they could extend it to a 10 year rule um, or even longer. Uh, and there have been um, this year reports, one produced by the all party parliamentary group, um, which has made recommendations for an immediate inheritance tax charge on lifetime gifts of 10 or 20 percent. So there's a lot to consider here and there is an ongoing consultation mm -hmm. and it's quite complex. So I would mm -hmm. say um, it wouldn't be too bold to say that we've got um, a long lead in time on all of that. Um, what you didn't mention, if I can bore you for a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, 
So wealth tax, this is really the tax that people have been talking about, thinking how is the government going to pay for the COVID debt? They have to do something. Um, and it was interesting that the FT money section last week is, introduced a survey for its readers and asking them uh, numerous questions about wealth tax and, and the viewers' thoughts on whether it should be compulsory, whether it's annual, a one-off, what rate, what assets, should it be based on on domicile, residence, citizenship. Um, and it is a difficult tax. Um, and I think realistically, it's not something that can just be brought in uh, overnight. To put some context here, in 1990, 12 European countries had a wealth tax and only three have a full wealth tax today, and that's Spain, Norway and Switzerland. Others have a form of wealth tax on selected assets, such as securities in Belgium and Holland and Italy too have a form of uh, selective regime wealth taxes. France had got rid of those in 2017. So although they generate income, and my word, this needs it, there are some significant downsides and they often push the rich and their wealth out of the country. So that, that capital flight argument. And we saw that to some degree in 2017, following the non-DOM changes. Um, so I think wealth taxes tend to tax the capital rich, um, but, but often the income poor. And um, they are hugely unpopular. They're difficult to enforce. They're difficult conceptually. Uh, and they're difficult administratively. So um, we've got to think about this carefully. The government have to. It's not something they've looked at in earnest since the 1970s. Um, but we have uh, Lord O'Donnell's uh, report, which is being carried out by the Institute of Fiscal Studies. Um, it's a wealth tax project. And the preliminary findings will be reported in mid-October with a final report in December. But, you know, it's not just the public that find a wealth tax unpopular. The Conservatives do as well. And it, it would be extremely divisive, divisive uh, at a time when uh, Boris is dealing with ongoing Brexit division. So, uh, in short, I think a wealth tax is 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 unlikely. Um, CGT and IHT change is more realistic. Um, but one thing I do say to my clients is it's worth noting that CGT and IHT generate a total of less than 1% of the total tax revenue for the Treasury. Um, it's highly politicised. It, it's linked to capital wealth. And we have seen Boris talking about levelling up uh, and wanting to reduce the disparity between rich and poor. So uh, are we on the brink of that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, over, over to you, I have no crystal ball. But in terms of tax revenue and enforcement, do expect revenue to uh, come down hard on invaders, aggressive avoiders and casual non-compliance. They'll still be working very hard to protect their revenues. Sure. OK. Um, so, Jeremy, if I can, I can bring you back in here. Um, what, what three top tips would you give uh, to people buying property in, in prime central London at this time? Um, three, well, uh, there are so many, but I think one of the key factors, and um, I'm going to quote Warren Buffett here, he's famous for saying, uh, you're much better off buying a wonderful company at a fair price than a fair company at a wonderful price, because the wonderful company even if you buy it for a slightly higher price, will always outperform. And the same is absolutely true for property. So um, you have to be incredibly selective. Just as an example of this, um, research by Savills showed that between 2005 and 2013, the top decile of properties in prime central London increased in value by 190%. That's 190%. While the bottom 10% only increased by 63%. Now, if you consider that includes the great financial crisis, 63% isn't that bad, but would I be wrong in suggesting that most people would rather be in the top 10%? Um, so you have to focus on what I describe as best in breed properties. Um, look, you're not gonna get that 190% outperformance in every area in price range, but in every area in price range, there will be properties that will outperform and those are the ones you need to focus on. Uh, 
Secondly, do your research. Uh, research has proven uh, that the majority of people go about buying property like they would buying a computer or booking a holiday. I mean, it, it's frightening how some people go about it. Uh, and that's British as well as international buyers. You know, they just look at a few things on the internet, see something like, go out, look at maybe seven or eight properties and buy one. Uh, it stuns me, but that's the way people go at it. You have, if you want to find the best opportunity that your money can buy and acquire it on the most favorable terms possible, you have got to do your due diligence. You've got to speak to all the agents in your target area. Um, you have to have a clear understanding of valuations. And then you also need to understand how to negotiate. And so my third tip, which uh, is to do with negotiations, is a lot of people get very worked up about the pound per square foot uh, price for property and use that to compare prices. But unfortunately, it's a very, very blunt instrument because uh, properties, it's not like buying a share where every share of um, you know, BP is the same. You know, every house on the street may look the same from the street itself, but will be very different inside. Some will have better layouts, better finish, different views, better outside space, maybe higher ceilings in parts of it. There are all sorts of variations. So um, pound per square foot comparisons are very dangerous, but also that leads to people just focusing on the facts. Whereas what you really need, facts are, are helpful, but in any negotiation, it is almost always the emotions that um, cause people to make decisions. We think we're rational, we're not. I mean, it's just it's just rubbish. And there are so many examples I can give you this, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, focus on emotions rather than facts. Use the facts, but you have to focus more on the emotional side of the transaction. Um, and then you will have far more success and negotiate prices that other people think uh, are impossible. Excellent, thank you. Um, and to round up then, Millie, um, what three um, top tips would you offer um, to people or say that are worth considering when they are buying property in London? Well, from from a non-legal perspective, I have a fourth tip. Give Jeremy a call, mm. clearly. <laughs> <Work your job. laughs> Don't expect your lawyer to do the negotiating because it's much better to have an agent for, on hand for that. But from let's talk about tax because that's my area. So um, I'm going to be asking, how should you buy this property? Is it going to be a trust? Is it going to be a company? Is it going to be uh, individuals, husband and wife? Are we going to throw in some children there, family members, and have co-ownership? And there will be a different answer for every set of circumstances. Um, is somebody American? Uh, if they are, please don't buy it in your name. Otherwise, you'll fall foul like Boris did, and there'll be capital gains tax in America when you sell it. Whereas if it is in the non-US citizen's name, there won't be. You know, there are issues, tax issues to take on board whether you own it outright or within a, a corporate or trust wrapper. Uh, so that's the first question, how to own it, how to fund it. So funding is a big deal as well. It links on from how you're owning it, whose name is it gonna be in? And particularly with my non-DOM clients, this can become really quite complex. Often a connected entity is going to be lending some money um, or there's an overseas mortgage, which isn't using the property necessarily as collateral. Or if it is, it's also using some overseas assets as collateral. And there are inheritance tax issues to consider there. So that's how are you going to fund it? And then the last one, uh, top tip for the moment, I would say uh, buy now. So we've got a, a stamp duty land tax holiday, which will give you that 15,000 odd saving. Um, and also we've got the surcharge coming in next April. So certainly if you're an overseas buyer by now, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't really talk about the market and values with any true authority, but from a tax perspective, now is a good time. Yeah, if I could also add to that, Jonathan. Um, mm -hmm. And what Millie said is, is absolutely right. In the first chapter of my book, um, I talk about the quickest way or the easiest way to get a price reduction, and it is to be prepared. Unfortunately, if you have a chapter called Preparation, no one reads it because it's too boring, but it is essential. And so people think that um, 
getting the tax structure in place is simple to be done, you know, at the click of your fingers. It takes much longer than that. And so before you even start looking for a property, speak to tax advisors, speak to your financiers, um, you know, instruct a solicitor, because when, when you're in a position to move swiftly, that's how you can um, negotiate price reductions because sellers want to be sure that they're dealing with someone who can act professionally and can act quickly. And it is, as I say, easiest way to get a price reduction and also means you won't miss out on your ideal home or investment because somebody can move quicker than you. Absolutely, I would agree with that entirely. Um, instruct uh, your advisors and your professionals to, to get involved as early as possible. Jeremy, Millie, thank you very much for that. Uh, I found that to be very insightful and I'm sure others will too. Um, if you do have any questions for me or Millie or Jeremy, please do get in touch. Thanks very much.